Hi, Saddleback Church. So you ever have one of those experiences where you go to your favorite restaurant, been there many times, and you're looking forward to just like the best steak dinner you've had in weeks, and the waiter says, I want to apologize, but we're not serving steak dinners today. Instead, we're serving tuna surprise. Surprise. Here we are. Got a call today at 128. Hey, buddy, what are you doing today? Now, we do need to pray for Rick. He, the message was ready. We had the notes in the bulletin. We had everything ready to go. And this afternoon, he just started feeling rotten and thought he wasn't going to be able to do, uh, do things well. So he asked me to step in. So I, I actually, before I go to the message, I do want to pray for Pastor Rick. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our dear friend and our pastor, Rick. We love him so much. And we're so grateful for his care for us and uh, all that he has done to build into our lives. And uh, today he is just not feeling well. So we're asking you, would you please be merciful toward Rick? Would you give him rest and strength and restore him to health? And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so I would tell you to pull out your message notes. <laughs> they would have made a, a fine paper airplane. Uh, I have no notes. But I do want to talk to you about a story, actually, that I think many of you are familiar with. I want to look at it possibly through a, an unfamiliar lens. Before I get into the passage, though, I want to ask you a question to set up where I'm heading in this message. You know, we've been in a series on family, and I want us to look at, at the model of love that we are to follow as we go into this message. So my question for you to start things off is this, what does God think of you? What's his opinion of you? When God thinks of you, does he just shake his head over all the dumb things you've done and all the mistakes and all the failures in your life? Or does he rejoice in the person that he is making you to become? When God thinks of you, does he only remember your past? Or does he dream about your future? The way you answer those questions, God's thoughts of you, his opinion of you, will have a profound impact on how you see God. And how you see God then determines how you will face God. So how do you see God? Do you see him as a harsh, disinterested judge? Do you see him as distant and uncaring? Do you see him as a demanding taskmaster? Or do you perhaps see him as a loving father? I want us to look at that picture today. We're gonna to look, as I said, at a familiar passage of scripture, but possibly in a way that we haven't considered it before looking at God as a loving father, because that is the picture that God gives to us as his primary identity to us, as a heavenly father. Yes, he's our creator, our savior, our provider, but first and foremost, he is our father. So I want us to look at this passage. It's a story that Jesus told, probably the most famous parable that Jesus told, and it's from Luke chapter 15. I put the words here on the screen. Let's, let's look at this. Jesus said that there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, basically what that son is saying is, Father, I wish you were dead. I want what's coming to me. I want nothing to do with you anymore. Give me, give me what's mine. Let me have it now. The only way you get your inheritance is through death. That's what he's saying. I wish you were dead. He says, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between the two sons. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. 
And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Now let's stop there in the story and just see what we can observe from it. As I said, many of you have heard that story before. You've certainly heard the title. Probably everybody in the, in the building has heard what we call this story. What do we call it? It's the parable of the, the prodigal son. We all call it the parable of the prodigal son. So one day as I was reading through this passage and thinking about the parable of the prodigal son, it dawned on me that nowhere in the text, in any translation, not even in the Greek, nowhere in the Bible does it refer to him as the prodigal son. So where did that come from? I was kind of puzzled by that. And I realized that there is a common misunderstanding of the word prodigal. I had the misunderstanding of it. So I looked up the word prodigal in my bright red dictionary to see what does prodigal mean? And I have the definition. I'm going to put it here on the screen. There's what prodigal means. It means exceedingly generous and lavishly wasteful. That's prodigal. Exceedingly generous and lavishly wasteful. So, with that definition in mind, it led me to the question, well then who is the prodigal in this story? If there has to be a prodigal, who is it? It's not the boy, he's just an idiot. <laughs> he's just stupid, doing stupid things. He's rebellious. Yeah, he's wasteful, of course he's wasteful. But actually when you think about it, he's more like his father than we wanna think that he was. Because after all, he wasted all of his resource with throwing parties. What did his dad do when the boy came home? He threw a party. He's just like his father. So I thought, well, then why do we call him a prodigal son? It, it's as though we are more disturbed by his lifestyle, his wastefulness, than the fact that he's lost. I'm going to say that again. It's as though we're more disturbed by his lifestyle than the fact that he is lost. So the boy is not the prodigal in this story. The real prodigal is the father. Because the father lavishes his love on this undeserving, rebellious boy. He is recklessly generous with his resource. When the boy says, I wish you were dead, give me what's coming to me, he gave it to him. That's reckless. It's lavish. And it says that when he came home, the father gave him a robe, sandals, and a ring. Let me explain to you what those represent. The robe is his identity. He gave him, he says, bring the best robe. What he's saying is this is the favored son. He said, put sandals on his feet. That's dignity. Because only slaves went barefoot. He's saying, this is not a slave. This is my son. Put sandals on his feet. And then he gave him a ring. That's authority. 
because the ring was a symbol that would be used like a seal in wax. It was so that he could conduct the family business. The father restores all of this to this son. So the father is the prodigal. And so is our father. Because he is exceedingly generous toward us, even when we don't deserve things. He lavishes his love on us, even when we are rebellious and broken even when we don't deserve it. And he gives to us a new identity. He calls us his sons and daughters. He gives us dignity. He gives us authority to do business in his name. Our father is a prodigal father. He lavished his love on this boy. And look at what the Bible says in 1 John 3 about our heavenly father. It says, how great is the love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And you know, we can think of a million reasons why God should be ashamed of us. A million reasons why we should not be able to come home to God. Because we all know our past. We all know our present. We all know our weaknesses, our sins, our mistakes, our hang-ups, our habits, whatever you want to call them, we all know what we've got. And so we, we think, well, there's no way that I can, I can come to God, not in the condition that I'm in. None of that is a surprise to God. We all know the distant countries that we have wandered off in. A distant country that's represented in this parable. The distant country is any place you go in your mind or your heart where you don't want your heavenly father to see you. And we've all wandered into distant countries. And so we can all think of reasons why we should not be able to come home, why we should not be worthy to be called sons or daughters of God. Instead, I'm just gonna be a slave in the household. God knows all of that. God knows your story. He knows what it has looked like and he knows what it looks like next. And he loves you. He loves you more than you will ever know. Now, am I saying that God doesn't care about those things? I'm not saying that. He cares very much about those things. God hates sin. But he loves you. And he will not let those things keep him from pouring his love into your life. Sin is what separates us from him. But God has made a way where there was no way through Jesus to find forgiveness and restoration and a welcome into the family. He is the one. God is the one who makes us holy. See, we think we have to straighten up and behave a certain way before we can come to God. It's like we have to make ourselves holy before we can come to God. And we get it all backwards. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves right before God. He's already done it. He's already provided the way. Only God can make us holy. And he does it through Jesus Christ. You see, holiness, listen to this. Holiness is not what God wants from you. Holiness is what God wants for you. It's his holiness, not yours. His righteousness, not mine. God wants his holiness in us and he's made the way through Jesus. The way for us to be reconciled to him. You see, you do not make yourself holy by changing your behavior. God makes you holy and he does it by making you innocent. And then, based on what God has done in your life, the gift that he gives you through his grace Then with the help of the Holy Spirit and through the power of his word and with the help, the support of the body of Christ, of other brothers and sisters of Christ, people who are following Jesus, then we begin to live out what the spirit of God is working in us. We begin to become what we already are, becoming the holy people that God has already declared that we are. We learn to live differently, to think differently, to act differently. We, live, we learn to live in the dignity and authority and identity that God has already given us just because we came to our senses and turned to our heavenly father. That's what changes our behavior. We don't change our behavior to be accepted. We change our behavior because we have been accepted. It's not the other way around. 
And that truth will affect how we see God. It will affect how we see ourselves. It will affect how we see the world and people who are not followers, people who are lost. We need to look at the rest of the story to see what happens. So I'm picking up now in verse 25. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. So all this party's going on. The older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry. By the way, let me just notice that there are two characters in this story who are angry when the son came home. The older brother and the calf. <laughs> Says the older brother became angry and he refused to go in. If he's in, I'm not going in. If God accepts him, I don't, then I'm not, I'm not interested. He refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father. He said, look, all these years I have been slaving for you. And I never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, any of you ever heard that kind of phrase before? <laughs> when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. And it's true. It already was. He had already divided up everything. So everything that was left already belonged to this guy. He says, everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and we had to be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, one of the things that we see in this story is that both sons were lost. They both saw themselves as slaves. The younger son, the rebel, said, I'm not worthy to be your son. Let me be a slave. Let me be a servant. The older son, the self-righteous one, he said, all these years I've been slaving for you. Both of them were lost. The younger son left home. The older son had never really been at home at all. But it tells us that the father went out looking for both of them. Now here's what else we see in this. And it's actually something that we don't see. What we don't see is what happens next in the story. We don't see what happens with this younger brother. Does he clean up his act? Does he behave himself? Does he go on to make something of his life? We don't know what happens next in the story. And maybe that's the point, is that we never know what's gonna happen next. And therefore, we cannot wait. We cannot withhold forgiveness and love while we wait to see what that person is going to do next. And the reason is because our love and forgiveness just might impact what happens next. The father did not say, oh sure, you can come on back and be a servant. Sure, that, that's fine, but you're gonna have to behave yourself and after you behave yourself long enough and well enough and you pass enough tests, well then maybe I'll let you back into the family. The father accepted him instantly. And I want us to see something else in this passage. I want to go back to verse 20. And I want us to look carefully at something here. Can we go back to verse 20? Here's what it says. While he was still a long way off. Let me ask you, do you know anyone who's a long way off? It says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. I have to ask my own, search my own heart. What am I filled with when I think of people who are a long way off? Am I filled with judgment, compassion, anger, love, P 
pity, hope, prayer. What am I filled with? It says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I want us to look at this again. We have to catch the order of something that's absolutely critical to our understanding of the heart of God. Look again, verse 20. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. It says he ran to him, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said, here's what we cannot miss. The kiss came before the confession. Before the son had a chance to say anything, the father kissed him. What are you waiting for to come home? God isn't waiting for you to apologize before you come home. He just wants you to come to your senses. When we just come to our senses and turn, he runs to us, embraces us, and kisses us. He embraced the boy while he was still in his filthy rags. He didn't make him go in and shower and change his clothes first. While he was still a mess, the father embraced him and kissed him. The kiss came before the confession. Here's what the Bible says about that. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not after we stopped sinning. While in the middle of it, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We do not change our ways in order to earn God's love and forgiveness. We change because we are already loved and forgiven. Think of the lost sons and daughters that you know. The ones who have run off to a distant country. They might even be, literally, sons and daughters in your family. People that you know have run off to a distant country. The ones who, who deep in their hearts really would love to come home. But maybe they're afraid to. Maybe they're ashamed to come home. What might a lost son or daughter do if we responded the way this prodigal father responded? And what might a lost son or daughter do if we respond the way the older brother responded? The self-righteous one. Because you can just imagine what would have happened if it was the brother who saw him coming home first. You can imagine what he would have said. What do you think you're doing coming back here after all you did to us? After the way you broke dad's heart? after the way you've wasted everything and ruined our family name and squandered your life, and now you come back here and think that we're just gonna say, oh, it was no big deal? You can imagine what he would have said to him. And I believe that one of the reasons that people don't come to God is because they are afraid of his judgment. But I also believe that even more people don't come home to God because they are afraid of our judgment. That we will treat them like the older brother would have treated them. That they won't fit in. They won't measure up to some standard that we've placed before them. That things won't work out. They're, they're afraid of all the hurdles we'll make them jump over. All the hoops they gotta jump through. They're afraid of the shame of the glances, of the whispers behind their backs. And so they'd rather just say, you know, I, I, I'm not good enough for that place. I'm not good enough for those people. And so they stay away. Or worse, they're driven away. I knew a woman years ago who had prayed for her husband to come to Christ for years. 
And when he finally came to his senses and began to turn his heart toward the father, she became impossible to live with. This self-righteousness just began to boil up. And he could not change his life fast enough to make her happy. He was still trying to find Jesus. But in her mind, it was you gotta stop doing this and stop doing that and stay away from those people and get away from those friends and start coming to these meetings and get into these groups and live this way and yada, yada, yada. And all of this, this pile of self-righteous rules and regulations that she began to put on him. She was actually more unhappy when he came to Christ than she was before he was a believer. And she just would not let him become. She just was trying to force him into her own little model of what it must be like. And he couldn't change fast enough to make her happy. He wasn't innocent. He was a broken man. He was living a life that you wouldn't want to live. But he was trying to find his way home. And she was blocking the door. Finally, while he was away on a business trip, she packed up the house and left him. She called it irreconcilable differences. She was acting like the older brother, picking on him for every little mistake, every weakness, and eventually she chased him not only out of the house, she chased him away from the church. It was infuriating to me because this guy was just, he was just hanging on to God by his fingernails and she was hanging on to his sin with her claws and refused to let go. One of her kids said to me, I guess we're just not good enough for her. And they left the church and went back to the distant country. We attract people to Jesus by attracting them to ourselves. And if we're mean and judgmental and hard-hearted, that's not going to attract anybody to Jesus, but if our lives are filled with the love of God, a love that is patient and kind and gentle and humble, a love that hopes, as the Bible says, a love that keeps no record of wrongs, a love that perseveres, if we are filled with that kind of love, then perhaps they can taste and see that the Lord is good. And they'll keep wanting to come home. Our father is a prodigal father who lavishes his love on us even when we don't deserve it. This afternoon as I was getting out of my car at 128 when the phone rang and I was told what I was gonna do. <laughs> as I was stepping out of my car from that phone call, a man came into my mind. It was a man that I, that I saw a long time ago. It was over 20 years ago. 22 years, actually. I was, I was speaking at a men's conference in Denver, Colorado. It was in the Pepsi Center. There were 16,000 men at this conference. And as the event started, it was on a Friday night and went all day Saturday, but on the Friday night as we started out, we always started with worship. And so they started uh, with an old hymn, actually. All hail the power of Jesus' name. It's amazing to hear 16,000 men sing that song. And when the song started, <clears throat> I walked out from behind the stage just to get into the crowd and to worship with the guys. And, and so they all stood up and seated in the front row was a man, young, early 50s. And right next to him, seated next to him, was his son, teenage son, in a wheelchair. And I mean, just at first glance, it was so 
obvious that this boy was severely handicapped. He was basically paralyzed from the neck down. He was blind. He couldn't speak. And I found out later in talking with his family that he had broken his neck playing football in high school. And when this music started and all the men stood up, his dad got out of his chair, he turned to his son, put his hands under this kid's arms. It's a big guy, right? Put his hands under the kid's arms and picked him up, plopped him on his feet and held him there and just started singing to him. Singing this hymn, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate, fall. bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. This beautiful old hymn of the church. This man is standing there holding this kid, singing to him at the top of his lungs with all these other men. And, and I'm watching this boy's face and this smile came onto this kid's face. It was like watching the sun break through the clouds because the boy could not see his dad's face. Couldn't see him, he's blind. But he could feel his touch and he could hear his voice. And he just started smiling. This man stood there singing. Well, the guys that are around him, they're all like reaching up behind the boy, trying to support him, hold him up. So while this dad is singing to him, everybody's crying who's anywhere nearby. And it wasn't just a nice little tear. Oh, isn't this sweet? It was like ugly snot bubbles kind of <laughs> crying. Everybody's just a mess watching this vision of heaven, of this loving dad singing over this broken boy. And they stood there for 10 minutes because we did three songs. And they stood there for 10 minutes, his father holding this kid, singing to him. And as I watched this, this vision, a verse of scripture, obscure verse of scripture from an obscure book in the Bible came into my mind. And I put it here on the screen. It's from the book of Zephaniah. I told you it was obscure. Zephaniah 3.17 says this, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. What I saw that night in Denver, Colorado was the word in the flesh dwelling among us. That man was walking prophecy. It was the word of God. It was the, what I saw in the face of that father was the absolute joy and love of, a, of the heavenly father. What I saw in the face of that boy was me and you and countless millions of broken people. There was nothing that kid could do to make his dad proud of him. Nothing. He was broken, but in his dad's eyes, this kid was beautiful. And the pride on this father's face, just because of who the boy was, his son, I saw the love of our heavenly father that night. And like that man, your heavenly father loves you. Not because of what you can do for him, but because of who you are. His son, his daughter, the one in whom he takes great delight and he rejoices over you with singing. That picture seeing those two also made me think of that prodigal father embracing that broken, failed son coming home. I have to ask you a question. I go back to what I asked you before. What does God think of you? What's his opinion of you? When God thinks of you and by the way, he thinks of you all the time. When he thinks of you, does he only remember your past or does he dream about your future? And my other question is, how do you respond to a love like that? A love that sings over you. 
You can deny it. You can say, oh, it's too good to be true. It doesn't apply to me and walk away from it. Or you can surrender. You can give your life over to the love of God. Give your life over to his embrace. Receive his forgiveness. And listen to him sing over you. We all have to make the decision of what we're gonna do with that kind of love because that love is already in front of you. That love is already yours. But the response now is up to you. And I wanna give you an opportunity right now to come home if you've never come home to a loving Heavenly Father. Would you bow your heads? I want us to pray together. And as you turn your, your heart in, in prayer, I want to address two groups here. Particularly, I want to ask a question. Do you relate to the older son in this story? As I was telling that story, I could see it in some of your faces. Are you standing between a lost son and a prodigal father? Are you guarding the door or opening the door? Are you blocking the way or showing the way? Are you pointing a finger of judgment or are you extending a hand of compassion? Search your heart. If God is convicting you of being self-righteous, of standing in the way of somebody who's trying, wishing, hoping they can get their life right with God, if you feel that you are standing in the way, if God's speaking to you, then in the quietness of your own prayer right now, you need to apologize to God. Tell him you're sorry. Confess it to him. And come into the house. Leave the self-righteousness behind and join the party, the celebration that God has when people give their lives to Jesus. In your own private prayer right now, just deal with this and talk to the Lord about your heart toward the lost sons and daughters that are in your life. And if you see yourself more like the younger son in this story, maybe you are in a distant country. You need to come home. You're not coming home to the anger of God. You're coming home to the love of the Father. He's waiting, looking for you. And so in the quietness of your own heart, you can just pray this way. I'll just give you some words to pray. Just say, Father, I wanna come home. I've run away, I've been in a distant country, I've been so far from you. And I've wasted so much time and so much of my life. I need to come home. And so I'm turning my heart to you. Lord, tonight I'm I'm coming to my senses. I don't understand all of it. I just know I'm desperately in need of your love and your forgiveness. So Lord, as much as I know how, I give as much of myself as I even understand, I just give myself to you and say, Lord, I'm coming to you. And I'll receive, I wanna receive your gift of forgiveness through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of my sins that he paid for and give my life over to you. And I ask you, Lord, would you put me on a pathway into a life that will please you, restore to me identity and dignity and authority. And I receive that, Lord. Let this be the day, this day, that I come home and start a new life with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.